All rise. Ladies and gentlemen, the Supreme Court of Alabama. Hear ye, hear ye. The Supreme Court of Alabama is now in session. God save the state of Alabama and these United States and bless this honorable court. Well, we thank all of you for being here today uh, for this case, and uh, we look forward to you folks illuminating us on this. We will have some questions for you, definitely, on this. And so, Madam Clerk, will you call the docket, please? In case number SC2022-0881, ex parte BTC Wholesale Distributors Incorporated, Arhan LLC, Birmingham Wholesale LLC, City Wholesale Incorporated, and the H.T. Hackney Company. Arguing for the petitioner, the Honorable Brandon Buck, and arguing for the respondent, the Honorable Forrest Lada, and the Honorable Bernard Hartwood. Mr. Buck? Mr. Chief Justice, Associate Justices, may it please the court. My name is Brandon Buck, and I will be arguing today on behalf of the petitioner defendants. The defendants are wholesale distributors that service convenience stores, or C stores. They sell and stock the hundreds of products that you find in a C store, everything from snacks and candy to toiletries and motor oil. This case relates to the sale of soft drinks, specifically Pepsi products. The plaintiff, Buffalo Rock, contends that its bottling agreements with PepsiCo entitle it to an absolute monopoly in the sale of Pepsi products. It, it contends that the convenience stores are prohibited from buying Pepsi products from the defendants even if Buffalo Rock fails to fill an order or refuses to send a truck to their place of business. So the question that will be decided in this case is whether Buffalo Rock is entitled to that absolute monopoly or whether the C stores have the freedom to purchase Pepsi products from a different supplier when they want to or they need to. In answering this question and in considering the, the issues in this appeal, we must remember three things. First, neither the C stores nor the distributor defendants have any contracts with Buffalo Rock. They are under no restrictions as to the sale of Pepsi products, contractual restrictions. Number two. Just, just to be clear, you're telling me the C stores did not have any contracts with Buffalo Rock? That, that's correct, Your Honor. The convenience stores, some of them buy from Buffalo Rock, some of them don't buy from Buffalo Rock, some of them buy from Buffalo Rock and the defendants, and they, they purchase Pepsi products from the defendants when they need fill-in orders that weren't filled or were late or, or they needed extra product that hadn't been delivered by Buffalo Rock. So, since, since I've got you, um, where did y'all buy your product? The, the defendants bought product from a variety of sources, but the biggest supplier, at least historically, to uh, the distributor defendants was a, uh, a distributor out of Atlanta, I believe, called Ronnie's a la carte. And did, Ronnie's did, did, a la carte acquired its Pepsi products from Pepsi Bottling Company, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of PepsiCo. So, the, so, so I saw that, that Pepsi Bottling Company, which is, like you said, a subsidiary, has 80% of the market nationally. Th that's right, Your Honor. So did your wholesalers ever buy directly from PBC? I don't believe any of the distributor defendants have purchased products directly from PBC. I believe they all came through a sub-distributor. So did any of your wholesalers ever buy from someone who had bought from Buffalo Rock, so for instance, a Sam's or a Costco or something in, in the state of Alabama? It's possible that has happened, uh, Your Honor, because Sam's and Costco and um, Dollar General, they often sell to other uh, retail outlets. 
So there's evidence in this case and in the record that some of the C stores themselves bought from some of those uh, Sam's and wholesale, Sam's wholesale and Costco and those places. Whether or not any of the distributor defendants bought from those, I don't know if that's in the record, Your Honor. So there's three things to remember in, in looking at the issues in this case. As I mentioned, there are no contracts uh, with the C stores or the distributor defendants that prohibit the sale of Pepsi products. Number two, buying and reselling soft drinks, which is also referred to as transshipping, is not illegal. There's an, it does not violate any law. And then third, state and federal law clearly favor open and free competition. Under Mr. Out let me, let me, I hate to interrupt you, but maybe you can help me out here. So we're here on a writ of mandamus, and the writ of mandamus is based on three motions in limine that the trial court granted. Those, to me, are evidentiary admissibility issues. So I appreciate what you're telling us about this, but the choices that we have don't really, at this point, right, go to the ultimate disposition of the case. It's really, to me, and help me if I'm missing this, is did the judge abuse his discretion in granting these motions in limine? Granted, if, if you can't put some evidence on, it could, I think, as somebody said, gut um, your defenses. But, but aren't we here really on kind of a, a little bit different tack that, that we can understand what you're ultimately getting us to do? But we're not there yet as I look at the posture of this case. So maybe you can help me see how I can get to the result that you're asking us to do, because I don't see that we're there yet. Well, I, absolutely, Your Honor. What the trial court did here was grant motions in limine excluding all evidence relating to three of the defendant's principal affirmative defenses. So the, these were rulings made on a motion in limine that exclude all, excluded all evidence and effectively granted uh, Buffalo Rock judgment as a matter of law on the defenses of justification, competitor's privilege, and illegality antitrust. So all that evidence, that whole swath of evidence has been excluded here. And, and it did so not on a Rule 56 motion, but on motions in limine. So, so those those orders that are before the court now need to be overturned for several reasons. Number one, agreements that contain restrictive covenants cannot be used to Sorry, bind. Mr. Buck, can I follow up just briefly on Justice Seller's line of thought? Um, Buffalo Rock, in their brief, um, submits that you all did not file your answers with the affirmative defenses. Um, do you know whether that's, do you agree with that or not? Or? Your Honor, the, our answers do include those affirmative defenses, and they move okay. to exclude those affirmative defenses. I believe what the, the argument, if I, under, if I recall correctly, what the argument or the remark that was made, I believe it was in a footnote, is that we didn't attach those answers to our appendix in the record. We didn't think that was necessary because there was clearly a motion to exclude those affirmative defenses, those motions in limine clearly. So, so the actual answer is not in the record. You, you agree with that? or? I agree with that, Your Honor. The actual answers are not in the record, but I don't think it's, there's no dispute that those affirmative defenses were asserted in the trial court. It, are, are there any other defenses that have been pled, affirmative defenses in this case that have been pled um, that aren't subject to this, or is this everything? The, the three defenses. affirmative defenses where all the evidence was disallowed okay. are the justification, competitor's privilege, and what we're calling illegality slash antitrust uh, defenses. So those are the three affirmative defenses that were asserted by all the defendants that are the subject of this petition. Okay. Are there any other defenses that you have that you know reasonably would be litigated ultimately in the trial of this case besides these that are in dispute? I mean, I understand a lot of defenses may get pled, but... There, there, there is a defense of failure to mitigate damages or the fact that there was a mitigation of damages that needs to be brought into evidence, and that, that sort of circles us back to the transshipment enforcement program or the TEP. It, it had to find liability first, presumably, before you get to that issue. That's right, Your Honor. That's right. Any other liability defenses besides these that are, that are an issue? Your Honor, those are the three primary defenses. Uh, whether or not another affirmative defense will be put into play at the, tr at the trial is a possibility, but these will be the focus, okay. no doubt about it. That's right. Thank you. 
So agreements containing restrictive covenants cannot be used to bind third parties. The law in Alabama is absolutely clear on this. Dating back to 1985, this court held that a person who has not executed or signed the contract or covenant is not bound by the stipulation against engaging in business, and he may not be enjoined from competing with the covenantee. That's the Russell v. Mullis case. There are other cases from this court that say the same thing. The Court of Civil Appeals picked up on that uh, line of reasoning in the Pinzone versus Papa's Wings case in 2010, again reinforcing that the existence of a covenant not to compete cannot be implied, cannot be proven by parole evidence, and, not, and cannot be used to bind a person who is not a party to the contract. The Alabama Restrictive Covenants Act reflects Alabama's policy favoring free and open trade. It begins with the statement that every contract by which anyone is restrained from exercising a lawful business other than, otherwise than is provided by this section is void. Now the court, um, excuse me, that statute allows there to be exclusive dealing agreements, but again the law is that exclusive dealing agreements between two parties cannot be used to bind a third party, and that is exactly what the distributor defendants are here. They have no contractual privity with Buffalo Rock or PepsiCo. So, Ms. Mr. Buck, I'm trying to understand this illegality and a trust argument. Um, there's no illegality defense except the antitrust argument, right? That's right, Your Honor. Our, our position is that the position that, that the, essentially what Buffalo Rock is trying to do through the court system, it could not do on its own. And, and that is- so, so you're arguing the junction that they're seeking would be a horizontal restraint. Absolutely, Your Honor. That's 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 the defense. That's right, Your Honor. That that and, and so that if is this going to be bifurcated? I read in the record there was discussion of having a trial about the injunction and having a trial about the damages side of the case. So is this? I mean, could could we just say, well, you know, the judge can hear this evidence, but you know, forget about the jury hearing it since it's relevant to the injunction. Your Honor, the defendants opposed that motion and the court denied that motion. So at this point, there's no There will not be bifurcation. That's right, Your Honor. That does it go to anything else other than the injunction they are seeking? No, Your Honor, I believe that's, I believe that's the case. I, I may get corrected by my co-counsel when I sit down, but I believe that's right. I think it goes to the injunction that the, essentially the relief they are seeking would be unlawful or in violation of antitrust law, illegal. Yeah, I'm concerned about antitrust laws, as you well know, the Sherman Act is very complicated. Antitrust cases go, trials go months. You know, I'm con concerned about the jury being confused. And so to sort of pick up what Justice, Justice Sellers says, I kind of see that ruling on that evidence as, you know, an evidentiary kind of ruling that a trial judge normally has discretion to do. Well, Your Honor, as to the injunctive, so, so what happened in the lower court, to put a little more meat on the bone, is that uh, Buffalo Rock asked the court to bifurcate and to try the injunctive relief first. And the opposition that we filed and, and what the court ultimately ruled is that that would be improper. When there are issues of fact that must be decided in order to arrive at an injunction, those issues have to be tried to a jury. And so those factual issues cannot be decided by the court and then an injunction entered without the jury taking up the fact questions. And so that's why it may be that the injunctive relief question could be pushed off after the other claims are decided, but it would be improper under the law to try the injunctive relief portion of the case first to the court, because the court, only the judge can, the, the, the question of equitable relief and injunction is a question for the judge, not the jury, but it will be decided on facts that must be decided by the jury. Um, I, there's, there's, another, there, there's another factor I want to mention here as it relates to trying to bind third parties with, this, uh, with these bottling agreements, and that is this. It's important to note that the, the bottling agreements between Buffalo Rock and PepsiCo do not even impose a duty on PepsiCo, the licensor, to prevent transshipping or the reselling of Pepsi products. That has been PepsiCo's position, and that position has been adopted by the Eighth Circuit in the Northern Bottling case, and by the Second Circuit in the South America Bottler versus PepsiCo case. 
So the amicus observed in its brief in this case that PepsiCo is the most prolific transshipper in the United States, and that comes straight out of the Northern Bottling case. If PepsiCo has no duty to police transshipping or to prevent transshipping, and its wholly owned subsidiary bottler, PBC, is the largest transshipper in the United States, then these bottling agreements between PepsiCo and Buffalo Rock cannot be used as a sword to prevent these distributor defendants who are not in contractual privity with them to prevent transshipping. They simply cannot control the conduct of third parties. And they don't even control the conduct of PepsiCo as, as, as held in those cases. Affirming the trial court in this case, allowing these rulings to stand, to stand would contradict numerous cases from this court holding that the justification defense with its seven-factor test is a jury issue and that legitimate competition justifies interference with business relations. And I point you to, going back to 1986, the Gross v. Louder Rock, case. your red light has come on. You may conclude your comment. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, in, in, I will reserve the, the, the balance of my time, but it, I would just uh, remind the court that we have um, – a TEP question that I will pick up on, and, the, and issues relating to the federal soft drink debt. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Lada. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Buffalo Rock has an exclusive license and that's what makes this case different from other tortious interference cases involving competitive contracts or business relations. To answer the evidentiary question, picture in your mind for a moment a decision tree. On one side, you have competitive contracts or business relations in which the parties can compete. On the other side, you have franchises, trademarks, patent license, or license agreements that result in established interests. With a competitive contract or business relation, parties have a general right to be free from improper interference, and the courts have devised a multi-factor test for determining whether certain interference is proper or improper, which is synonymous, meaning the same as justified. And so the term has been used, the justification factors for that test. But not with an exclusive license. Buffalo Rock has a franchise. It stands in the shoes of the trademark holder. It has a property right that's not subject to competition. Its purpose is to create certainty and to encourage long-term investment in the, in the type of brand building and infrastructure necessary to support a distribution network. Mr. Lada, do, do you have an Alabama case that says that we get to ignore the justification factors uh, because it's an exclusive license? There's two cases that I would that I have in mind, Your Honor. One would be the Alcazar case that uh, dealt with a movie theater that had an exclusive license to show a particular movie, and a competing theater tried to show the same movie, and. Uh, the owner of the, uh, uh, of the theater brought a, a tortious interference case. That would be one. A more recent example would be one like the Ecolab case or Tom's Foods. In those two cases, the question was whether the competitive privilege applied because you had a situation where you had two competitors in the snack food business in Tom's Foods, so they were in the same space. They were direct competitors, okay? And so one was arguing competitive privilege and the court observed that that would be a defense if the contract is terminable at will. If a contract is not terminable at will, then it's not subject to competition. And so that defense would not apply. And since competitors' privilege is just really a variation of the justification factors, it's sort of a higher form that applies to people who are in direct competition, then that would be a good example of the court essentially saying that we don't get into the justification factors if we have an established interest, such as in that case, a contract that would be not terminable at will. Mr. Latta, yes. let me ask you, uh, can you point to any case, in, whether in Alabama or, or 
perhaps in another jurisdiction, where a party similarly situated to the petitioners was denied the opportunity to present a justification defense? A good example uh, would be one out of North Carolina. As you, as you all know, the, these types of cases, tortious interference, especially with exclusive contracts, are, are not all that common. We don't have that many in Alabama, and that's true nationwide. But you can look to the, 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 the decisions of other courts where the law is very similar, and in North Carolina there's a case called Bassett Seamless Guttering versus Gutter Guard. This is the, the gutters you put around the roof of your house. And uh, these two companies were competing. One had the exclusive contract for the product. And the court was uh, very clear that that exclusive contract, in that case an exclusive license like we have, guarantees the economic advantage of operating without fear of, comp of competition in the market. And so therefore, by definition, it has a prospective economic advantage that's entitled to be protected from any competition. And the court said it's no defense to say that the plaintiff who had an exclusive territory under the contract would not have made the sales. And so therefore, a, a party that wanted to say, well, we, we were trying to fill a gap in the market. You couldn't, you couldn't meet all of the demand. Um, and therefore, we're justified. And the court, if you'll read that opinion, said that the justification factors don't apply. What's and the under what's the site on that case, Mr. Um, that is Bassett versus Gutter Guard, 501 F Sup Second 738 from 2007. I see it here. And I would also uh, point your your honor to the restatement comments. We're talking about the restatement second. Um, but in, in the comments, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a suggestion that any interference would be comparable to negligence per se with, a, uh, with an exclusive contract. So you might say improper per se. Uh, the justification factors wouldn't apply, and so it's not a jury question as to whether or not Buffalo Rock's license agreement would be enforceable. And any factual argument of justification is simply not relevant or material, and therefore would not be admissible. The term used by courts to describe uh, those who aren't licensed distributors, uh, who aren't licensees of companies like Pepsi, and who haven't invested in building the brand, is transshippers, as you've heard, or free riders, uh, who are not answerable to Pepsi. This is important because Pepsi, being the owner of the trademark, wants to be able to control the entire process of manufacturing and distribution from the plant to the customer's mouth. And so um, Pepsi places very strict restrictions, requirements on Buffalo Rock for the manufacture and distribution of its product. So if a product is being sold outside of the distribution system, then Pepsi has no control and no ability to monitor the quality of the product. So what... Mr. Lida, it the, there's no allegation that the defendants manufactured the product themselves, right? They bought it from somebody who was a licensed Pepsi manufacturer, right? Your Honor, not from a licensed Pepsi manufacturer. Uh, the, the, the defendants, it's a real question where they got the product. Okay, they bought it indirectly from a licensed Pepsi manufacturer. They didn't manufacture it themselves, right? Facts are all over the place. Anytime you have a gray market, it's very hard to pinpoint where those... Uh, there, there are no facts that says they manufacture it themselves, right? Well, they didn't manufacture themselves, no. There, there's no facts that says that somebody else, other than a licensed Pepsi manufacturer, manufactured these bottles that they sold. I'm not sure I understand the question, but the, the, the evidence and the allegation is that these trans shippers bought it from somebody who bought it from somebody who may have bought it from a licensed distributor. And there's no way that the licensed, the, the licensed distributor... These aren't counterfeits, that's my point, right? They're not counterfeit, but they don't always measure up to the quality requirements that Pepsi has. Uh, but Pepsi has no way to really be able to, to monitor. These, these are carbonated soft drinks. And any carbonated soft drink is subject to weather conditions, storage conditions. If you walk into a, uh, a, a, consumer, a, a consumer facility and you want to buy, for instance, a convenience store, you want to buy, and we're talking mainly about the 20 ounce sizes, these grab and go sizes that are sold at convenience stores. 
If you buy one of those and it's dusty or dirty or it's been outside or it's been dropped uh, at, at the back of the convenience store and not stored properly, then you run the risk of getting something that doesn't measure up to your expectations. And so that, that, that can happen little by little, one by one, everywhere, and what that does is erode the brand and, and eventually erodes the value of, of the exclusive license that, that uh, Buffalo Rock has. So the judge got it right, and it was certainly not clear error that with an exclusive license, transshippers cannot claim justification as, uh, or, or competitor's privilege for misappropriating Buffalo Rock's property rights under its exclusive license. Uh, I'd like to also address four misstatements in the transshippers reply brief since we haven't had a chance to, to, to respond to that and that, that, that need to be spotlighted. I mentioned the Alcazar case and the reply brief makes the incorrect statement that Alcazar has been rejected by the Louder Realty decision. It was not rejected, but instead was re-adopted by Louder Realty as essentially a correct statement of the current law and the majority position on tortious interference. And Alcazar, which was mentioned earlier, is a really interesting case involving the early years of silent movies. And uh, I recommend that you read that case. And it's got, uh, it's, it's a good early example that shows that it's not anything new to bring a tortious interference case to enforce an exclusive license. In that case... Mr. Lada, the Alcazar case is not Alabama law anymore, right? I mean, we, we said that in the Green, the Green case, we said it wasn't Alabama law, that it was dicta. We said it was not was not authoritative. I'm quoting, not authoritative. And then in the Gross case, uh, it says, quote, two years later, two years after Alcazar, we adopted a far narrower recognition of the cause of action. So I, I, I just don't understand your argument that Alcazar is still good law. I mean, we've said it over and over. It's not good law. Well, Your Honor, uh, you'll get me going on the Alcazar case, and, it's, and, and, and let me respond to you by saying that Justice McClellan, who wrote that opinion, a few years earlier had written another case called Sparks versus McCrary, which recognized the, the tort of interference. He could have cited himself in that opinion, but we had those two cases, and then the court seems to have gone in another direction toward a narrower definition of the tort of interference in the Louisiana Oil versus Green, Erswell Ford. But then in the louder case, if you read the, the opinion and the footnotes, the court says, we went in the wrong direction. That was too narrow of a cause of action that we recognized. So we're going to come back and recognize that you know, sometimes the minority position becomes the majority position. And we're going to hold that Alcazar really represents the majority position. And we are repudiating those cases, Louisiana Oil versus Green, Erswell versus Ford, as not representing the majority position now. And so as you read, uh, the, Al as you read the Louder Realty case, you'll see that it's a strong validation of what the court had earlier held in the, in the Alcazar case. So that's why we wanted to respond to that here in this argument today, because in their reply brief, it's just, it's a misreading of that case to say that Alcazar is not good law, that it's been repudiated, that somehow we're pointing to the wrong type of case law as an illustration of enforcing an exclusive license. It's, a, it's almost a perfect illustration, and it's got a good summary that sounds very modern of the tort of business interference. Another statement that I want to point to that they made is about the timing of Buffalo Rock's motions in limine, that they were filed on the eve of trial, which is incorrect. The parties had gotten together and agreed on a scheduling order in which both sides could submit motions in limine three months before trial, and they could submit evidence and arguments and briefs, and they did so, and then the court held a four-hour hearing on both sides' motions in limine, leading to a decision that granted, essentially granted, both sides' motions in limine. It wasn't just Buffalo Rock's motions that were granted. Uh, the transshippers' motions were granted, too. It granted the motion with respect to any evidence prior to two years before the suit was filed under the statute of limitations. It granted the transshippers motions that we couldn't use the word bootlegging, even though that well represents what was happening here. 
uh, but it was said to be too prejudicial in front of the jury. Uh, it also granted our motions in limine with respect to these, uh, the, the defenses which don't apply here, and therefore the evidence was irrelevant and immaterial. So Mr. Lettle, let me just jump in again because my concern about this. So what we're, what the other side is saying is these motions in limine basically gut our affirmative um, defenses. And so if we can't have these affirmative defenses, then we automatically lose as an equivalent to a motion for summary judgment. Are there any other defenses left? I mean, can this, with these motions in limine being granted, can this case actually go to trial and the, uh, and the defendants put on any defenses? Really good question, and the answer to that is that if, if you follow the comments of the restatement, that if you have an exclusive license or some other established interest is the terminology that the restatement uses, that uh, these justification factors are not valid defenses because there's no right to compete um, for, a, a, in this case, a contract that is an exclusive license. And so I mean, I, mean I hear what you're saying, but I guess because I know we're running a little close on time, do, do they have any defenses at all? I mean, is, this, is that an not. accurate statement? They have no defenses, or, or are there something they can actually put on at trial to defend themselves? They, the plaintiff still has to prove its case, and their defense would be that Buffalo Rock cannot prove the various elements of its cause of action, as well as defenses to damages, which, we, which we've already talked about. Uh, but it, the only thing left is damages, right? I mean, uh, well, there's no. a contract here. If you're looking at the elements here, there's a, there's a contract. The defendant's knowledge of the contract, well, y'all sent them letters. Pepsi sent them demand letters, so they certainly know about the contract. Uh, there's a contract. Um, there's intentional interference. Again, Pepsi sent them letters, so they, and then they continued to do it, so we know there's intentional interference. Um, and then there's damage. So the only thing left for trial is damage, right? It's a strong case, Your Honor, and um, I don't know that we could go so far as to say that we would be entitled as a matter of law. Um, we didn't file a motion for summary judgment, an affirmative motion for summary judgment, but we do think that that would be, your analysis is correct to the extent that there would not be any defense on their part, that they're justified in competing with our exclusive license. In my short remaining time, let me just point to a couple of other items. Um, you touched on this restraint of trade idea, that that somehow is a defense. Section 8-1-190 is what sets forth the uh, law that says that a contract in restraint of trade is void. So what they're arguing is that our exclusive license is void because it is a restraint on trade. But it doesn't violate that statute. There's not anything in our contract with Pepsi which places a restraint upon either Pepsi or Buffalo Rock, except to the extent of the territorial restrictions. And then furthermore, he doesn't mention that B2, section B2 of that same statute, has an express exception for contracts of exclusive dealing. Mr. Latta, your time has expired. You may complete your thought. Thank you. And to summarize, the trial court's ruling was not clear error. We would ask the court to deny the mandamus but we would also ask the court to go one step further and write an opinion to clarify for the business community, for courts and counsel, that in business interference cases involving an exclusive contract, the justification factors don't apply. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. Mr. Harwood? Mr. Chief Justice and Honorable Justices, I'm going to triage my argument somewhat in recognition of the um, constraints of time, but I think it's important at the start to say it's, I think it should be very telling to this court that two arch rivals, two strong competitors in the market, Pepsi-Cola and Coca-Cola, who are usually like mountain goat rams butting heads competing in their respective markets, are here today joined through their association saying, look, if you allow continued poaching of our exclusive um, agreements by, I understand the term bootlegging is probably um, not politically correct according to the judges, thing, but pirating, I will say. If you come in and, you, and, and um, take our customers who supposedly in this market, if they're going to buy, should buy for us because we have bought and honor the exclusive right to have this trademarked product and we have done everything to promote this brand and try to make people want Pepsi as opposed to Coca-Cola. 
I know people who I've gone into a restaurant, oh, you don't carry Pepsi products, well, maybe we'll go somewhere else, or you don't carry Coca-Cola. So we are here today on behalf of the association saying, we, as all of our members, including Coca-Cola, um, support Pepsi, in this case, Buffalo Rock's position, that if this, this sort of widespread pirating of our exclusive rights to sell this trademark product is not checked, it will have damaging, and perhaps to some of these bottlers, even fatal consequences. I would call your attention to the Soft Drink Act, where in 1980, before it was passed, the Senate Judiciary Committee did a long report it, analyzing whether, this, whether you should have this sort of protection against antitrust. And among the findings, the committee said, the committee has concluded that the present territorial franchise system, and I'll digress to say this goes back to um, uh, turn of the century, these sort of franchise exclusive agreements where you can only sell our brand, but we're gonna give you the right to sell it exclusively in this territory and it's trademarked. The um, committee said, we recognize that the destruction of the system is likely to depress the value of the franchise bottling plants and cause tremendous economic harm to hundreds of small bottlers who have depended on this system for many years. The committee went on to say that the um, administrative law judge who had heard all the evidence on this before the um, committee got around to it said indeed the judge found that competition of the territorial provisions that uh, sorry, elimination of the territorial provisions would adversely affect com competition because it would lead to the business failure of many small and some large bottlers as well as the accelerated growth of large bottlers and the contributions to the economics of the area in which small bottlers and their employees now earn their livings would certainly diminish substantially and would disappear completely where the bottler was forced out of the business. So this is not the situation that I've seen many amicus briefs where the opening line is this is the apocalypse, the, like Henny Penny, the sky is falling. If you don't rule in this case in our favor, it'll be the end of civilization as we know it. These independent bottlers are joined together to say if we continue to have these encroachments from these transshippers, then we're not going to be able to continue in business. And, and who are the transshippers and exactly what is their business model? Well, uh, hey, on page- Mr. Harwood, could I ask yeah. you a question? I, I wanna ask you in reference to this, if I understood Mr. Buck correctly when he was up here, that, does one of Pepsi's subsidiaries or affiliates, Pepsi Bottling Company, sell product to the transshippers? Not to, not to my knowledge, um, Justin Menheim, but on the other hand, let me have sort of a disclaimer representing across the board both Coca-Cola and Pepsi in this, I've been scrupulously careful not to inquire too much into the business model of Pepsi-Cola because these are trade secret sorts of things. So I've tried at my level to um, uh, well, that avoid getting into that. The Pittsburgh bottling case that you cited in your briefs, that was exactly the facts that Justice Mitchell is referring to, right? Because Pepsi Bottling Company was the defendant transshipper in that case, right? Yes, sir. Um, and so uh, transshipping has been going on for a long time, right? I mean, it's been, this, is have, this is a problem that's been around for 100 years, right? I exactly. And so I've looked through your briefs and through uh, the brief of the, of the plaintiff here, and I, I don't see a single case where there's been a plaintiff's summary judgment granted against a transshipper on a tortious interference case. Is, is there such a case? No, I, I, I'm not aware of one. Um, just We've been breaking new law here. I, you, well, I would say this. That it's like they all say the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. The absence of a case just means, well, it hadn't come up. It's coming up to this court. I sometimes am concerned when I see briefs that, well, you, under Rule 28, you didn't cite these cases. Well, there aren't any cases. So sometimes you're left with that. That's right. This would be new law to the extent of each one of these cases that's come along gross white sand is acknowledged. We're having to come back and sort of reorder what got out of control. I mean, we had all the cases saying, well, affirmative defense. I mean, this is an affirmative defense. No, it's not. Uh, that is justification. So, Mr. Harwood, your time has expired. You were led beyond your time by questioning from the bench, so you may complete your answer to the question and give us a wrap-up statement. I would simply conclude, um, Mr. Chief Justice, by saying on page 13 of our amicus brief, we list all the parts of the record 
where, these ver where the Rule 36B representatives of these various transshippers were questioned. And if you read that, it's very clear. They say, look, this is a very min minuscule part of our business. We're selling, some of them say, we're selling over 130,000 products. One of them said, our business generally is like 35 million. Well, how much of that is the business of you selling Pepsi? Uh, one tenth of one percent when you look at what they said. So this is a situation where if we're talking about the equities of an injunction, the, the, the equities will lie in five here. It's not going to hurt any of these folks. Each one of these folks said, one of them said, I wish I could get out of the business. It's a pain in the rear, frankly, because these big heavy products t damage our trucks and we'd like to get out of the business, but all my other wholesalers are there, so I've got to do it for my customers. So in this case, the protectable rights, the protectable interests of our members greatly outweigh for injunction purposes the very minuscule um, involvement that these transshippers would have as far as not being able to sell this, unless they buy from us. They're willing to do it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Madam Clerk, will you please add more time for Mr. Buck so we're equal between the sides on this. Mr. Buck? Thank you, Your Honor. To put a fine point on it, there is no Alabama case that supports disallowing these affirmative defenses as a matter of law. And the existence of an exclusive license agreement between PepsiCo and Buffalo Rock does not change that. The exclusive license is a factor that will be considered in the justification defense. There are seven factors in a justification defense. It looks at the nature of the defendant's conduct, the defendant's motive, but most importantly as to this exclusive license issue, the interests of the plaintiff with which the defendants interfered. So this is, this is part of the justification defense. This is a, an issue that will be, that the court, it, that the jury is supposed to consider. And there is case after case after case from this court saying that the issue, the question of justification is generally a question of fact for the jury, starting with the Gross v. Louder case, the Soap v. Ecolab case says that. Now there is one case that I would direct your attention to that is the Bama Budweiser of Montgomery versus Anheuser-Busch case. That's a case from this court from 1992. And in that case, the court affirmed summary judgment for a distributor defendant. In that case, it was a beer distributor, but affirmed summary judgment for a beer distributor on a justification defense. And in that case, what had happened is the beer distributor had, it, had, an, had a territory from Anheuser-Busch, but it sold outside that territory into Montgomery County, which was a territory reserved for another distributor. And what this court said in affirming summary judgment in that case is that it is undisputed that the defendant had serviced the Montgomery accounts for years and that the defendant merely continued to do what he had always done to secure a profit the trial court correctly concluded that the defendant acted only for the sake of legitimate business purposes. So here, we're not even, we, we're not asking for summary, we're not asking this court to award summary judgment on the justification defense for the defendants. We're simply asking to allow these defendants, excuse me, these defenses to go to the jury as they should. Mr. Buck, I, I want to ask you, I, I understand your legal argument. I, I'm curious about whether you Past the mandamus test. We're here on mandamus, and we know we all know the requirements for being able to get over mandamus. And one of them here, I mean, one of them in every mandamus proceeding is: Have you established that you have a clear legal right to the relief that you're seeking for this extraordinary writ? You know, I look back at the White Sands case about the justification defense, and it says that that's generally a jury question. And so, I guess my question to you is: Is that enough for you to get over the clear legal right? Uh, hurdle on mandamus, and if so, why? Your Honor, if you look at the ex parte Teal case, it talks about the fact that the disallowance of an affirmative defense is reviewable on mandamus. Your question is, do we meet the mandamus standard? And, and I would say yes, because as, as several of the justices have pointed out here, we, the, the defendants basically have no defense. They have, this has struck all of their principal affirmative defenses. And so we go to trial, and we, we go through trial for a week, two weeks. We, we're not allowed to present these defenses. 
They are clearly jury questions, as, as this court has said over and over again. And so we believe we have a clear legal right under the Alabama law, under Alabama case law, to present these defendants. And that clear legal right has been taken away. So we think we do meet that standard, Your Honor. Um, I, I would also just briefly to point on Alcazar, Justice Cook is, is exactly correct. Alcazar uh, is, is not the law and arguably never was the law. And that, that takes you back to the Louisiana Green versus Green Oil case. And then in 1986 in the Gross v. Louder case where this court revisited the law comprehensively on intentional interference and stated, and I'll quote, it, it, we are updating, quote, what we perceive to be an outdated and inconsistent body of law pertaining to intentional interference. It went on to say, we retain the principle that justification is an affirmative defense. Whether the defendant is justified in his interference is generally a question to be resolved by the trier of fact. The other thing I want to mention here, uh, a couple things just briefly. There's no allegation in this case that the Pepsi products that were sold here by the defendants are counterfeit in any way. There's no evidence of quality problems. There is no evidence in the record of a single complaint, quality complaint, about any of the products sold by the defendants. As to competitors' privilege, because that came up, um, this argument that um, you can't have a competitors' privilege defense when, when a contract is um, not terminable at will. The competitor's privilege defense admittedly may not be a valid defense to the interference with contractual relations between PepsiCo and Buffalo Rock because there is a, a, a defined contract, the EBAs, and so we would concede that we are not, we being the defendants, are not competitors as it relates to that contract with PepsiCo. But as to the convenience stores, which is the bulk of this case, there is no contract between Buffalo Rock and the convenience stores. So this argument that the competitor's defense does not apply when uh, there is a contract that is not terminable at will um, has no application to the interference with business relations uh, claim as it relates to the convenience stores. Your Honor, I want, to turn, I want to turn just briefly to the transshipment enforcement program while I have a minute or two left. The TEP, as it's referred to, is a central component of the relationship between PepsiCo and its bottlers, including Buffalo Rock. It awards syrup credits to a bottler when it discovers Pepsi in a bottler's territory that was bottled by a different bottler, and it finds the offending bottler whose product was transshipped. The trial court here excluded all evidence relating to the transshipment enforcement program based on the collateral source rule. But the TEP is relevant to many issues other than damages, and the collateral source rule doesn't apply. First of all, Buffalo Rock's complaint, you need to know that Buffalo Rock's complaint spends several pages discussing the TEP. It is a central component of the relationship between Buffalo Rock and PepsiCo. This is an interference case. Buffalo Rock cannot claim interference with a business and contractual relationship, but exclude evidence relating to a critical part of that relationship. In that same vein, the TEP is not a collateral source at all. The TEP is, well, PepsiCo works the TEP program. It was set up by PepsiCo. This is not a situation where you've got a third party insurer who the, the plaintiff went out and, and procured an insurance contract from, which is the normal circumstance in which the collateral source rule arises. Here, there is no collateral in this situation. PepsiCo is Buffalo Rock's licensor, and it is directly involved in the transshipment enforcement program. Furthermore, its wholly owned subsidiary, PBC, is the, is the nation's largest transshipper. So we don't even get to the collateral part of the collateral source rule. In addition, the TEP relates to several of the justification factors. And so if justification is a defense, then, then the TEP evidence needs to come in on several of those factors, including the relationship between the parties, the nature of the defendant's conduct, and others. Lastly, uh, in closing, I see my time's almost up. I'd just like to make clear that what the petitioner defendants are requesting here is that the court enter a writ of mandamus requiring the trial court to admit all evidence 
relating to the justification and competitor's privilege defense, admit, allow evidence to be admitted relating to the antitrust illegality defense, and admit evidence of the TEP, which is rela relevant to many issues other than damages. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bach. And our thanks to counsel from both sides. Uh, there was good give and take between the bench and the bar today. Thank you for that. This court is adjourned.